Good morning. I'm Phil Keller of Metrolab. I'd like to talk to you this morning about a technology for measuring magnetic fields called the Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, NMR. If we look at the panoply of techniques that we have for measuring magnetic fields, NMR has a very special place. So let's take a look at this graph that uh, categorizes all the different techniques as a function of magnetic field range on the horizontal axis and precision on the vertical axis. If we look at this graph, we see that NMR uh, and the related technique, ESR, electron spin resonance, are at the very top of the graph. This means that they have the highest possible precision ranging better than a part per million. What's more, NMR provides an absolute measurement, meaning that it doesn't change as a function of temperature, the orientation of the sensor, or the age of the sensor. It is, in many ways, the perfect uh, magnetometer. For these very reasons, NMR magnetometers are often considered the gold standard of magnetometers. In other words, when we're calibrating other magnetometers, we often use NMR magnetometer as the reference instrument. So let's take a look at how NMR magnetometers work. The basic physics is this. Some nuclei act as if they're spinning on their axis. And since they have charge, they're, they behave like small current loops, and they generate a magnetic moment which we call in this graph mu. That you can think of these as little permanent magnets, little atomic sized permanent magnets. And these atomic magnets will align themselves in an external magnetic field that we're here we're calling B0. Not only will they align themselves in the magnetic field, if they're not exactly aligned, they will also precess around that magnetic field, just like a spinning top will precess around the Earth's gravity. The frequency of that uh, precession is a characteristic frequency known as the Larmor frequency. Now, here's the important part. The Larmor frequency depends not only on the magnetic moment, mu, but also on the strength of the magnetic field, B0. In fact, mu is constant, and the dependence on B0 is exactly linear. So this gives us a very accurate way of measuring the magnetic field. So how do we measure the Larmor frequency? Well, if you crank through the math, it turns out that you can influence the direction of the mu vector by applying a small alternating uh, magnetic field uh, that we call B1 in this, uh, in this graph perpendicular to the primary field that you're trying to measure, B0. At first, not much happens. But as we increase the frequency, as soon as we hit exactly the Larmor frequency, something magic happens. All of a sudden, the magnetic moment starts to flip and gradually moves away from the, uh, the B0 direction. This is the magnetic resonance that we're talking about, the nuclear magnetic resonance that NMR uh, stands for. Well, B1 is generated by a small coil that surrounds a bit of sample material that has the spins. We drive this coil with a frequency generator that's capable of sweeping through a wide range of frequencies. When the signal generator hits exactly the Larmor frequency, the spins start flipping and the bulk magnetization starts oscillating from the precession uh, that is, gives a minute but detectable oscillation of the bulk magnetization of the sample. In the introduction, I mentioned um, electron spin resonance, ESR. Uh, it's exactly the same technique, except instead of applying to nuclear spins, it's applying to a, the spin of a free electron. As we mentioned, the Larmor frequency depends linearly on the uh, external magnetic field B0, the flux density. And the slope of this line is called the gyromagnetic ratio. Now here are a few values of the gyromagnetic ratio for some typical nuclei. The gyromagnetic ratio of the proton, 
or a hydrogen nucleus, is about 42.5 megahertz per Tesla. Gyromagnetic ratio of a deuteron uh, or a proton uh, combined with a neutron um, is about six times lower, about 6.5 megahertz per Tesla. On the other hand, the gyromagnetic ratio of electrons is about three orders of magnitude higher, meaning that we can measure lower fields uh, with the same frequency range uh, using ESR. So let's talk about the benefits of NMR as a magnetometer. One of the key benefits is that it depends only on a precise knowledge of the magnetic moment of the nucleus that we're uh, using as a sample material and a precise measurement of the Larmor frequency, which we can measure very, very precisely. So this is what provides an absolute measurement. It doesn't depend on anything else. It doesn't depend on temperature. It doesn't depend on how you hold the sensor. Uh, it doesn't depend on the age of the sample material. It is just very basic physics. Another benefit is that the resonance peak is very narrow. Typically, in a proton sample, uh, we're looking at a resonance peak that's about one hertz, on the order of that. If you take that one hertz and the uh, Larmor frequency of 42.5 megahertz at one Tesla, you end up with a resolution of something on the order of 0.02 parts per million. Not bad. Another key benefit of NMR is that the answer you get doesn't depend on the orientation of the coil. Now, it's true that the coil should be perpendicular to the main field, the B0, but it doesn't matter if it's a little bit off. All that happens is that the sensitivity drops off a little bit, but you always get the same Larmor frequency. Okay, so we're convinced that this is a wonderful technique. Now, how do you actually build an NMR magnetometer? Here's the recipe. First of all, we need a sample material. The key characteristic of the sample material is that it has to have a spin. Now, that may seem obvious, but actually it isn't. Many atoms uh, have nuclei with an even number of protons and neutrons in them. Uh, so, for example, uh, oxygen-16 or carbon-12. Um, these spins of the protons and neutrons, they align, counter-align themselves, they pair up, and they end up canceling out, and the nucleus ends up with zero spin. So, first requirement is the, pro the nuclei have to have a spin. Secondly, as we saw, we need an excitation coil to generate this B1 alternating field. Now, the excitation coil, as we saw, doesn't have to be exactly perpendicular to the ma magnetic field that you're measuring, but it helps if it is pretty much perpendicular. To improve the signal-to-noise ratio of the, of the detector, we often wire a capacitor in parallel uh, with, that, uh, with that coil, with that B1 coil, making an LC resonator. And this makes a filter that throws out much of the out-of-band noise and greatly improves the signal-to-noise ratio. If we want to make a very wide-band range uh, probe, we have to use a variable capacitor uh, that allows us to tune the resonance over a wide range of frequencies. Then we need a signal generator to drive this coil. Uh, the signal generator is part of the most difficult uh, things to build because it has to have a very wide range uh, and be, at the same time, very, very stable. This is an engineering challenge. We also need some sort of detector to detect when we've hit the Larmor frequency. As you can see, there are two different ways of doing this, continuous wave detectors and pulsed wave detectors, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Finally, for continuous wave detectors, we need also some sort of modulation. We need to sweep uh, either the frequency, which is usually what you want to sweep, but that may be difficult, and so an alternative is to sweep the magnetic field by adding a small modulation coil and modulating the, uh, the fields that you're actually trying to measure. Okay, 
All right, now, so now let's talk about the difference between a continuous wave detector and a pulsed wave detector. A continuous wave detector is like tuning a radio. You flip the dial, and you hear the radio station go by. In this case, we hear the Larmor frequency go by. You might either detect the absorption peak, because the sample starts absorbing a small p- uh, bit of energy, or uh, another technique that's been used is to have a um, detection coil that is perpendicular to the B1 excitation coil, and it detects when those f- fl- uh, spins flip by 90 degrees. This is actually the technique that was used in the original NMR experiments. Pulsed wave detectors, on the other hand, are like hitting a clock. We hit the sample with a relatively wideband pulse, and then we f- this flips the spins by 90 degrees, roughly, and that means they precess perpendicular to the main field, and we can pick up that precession and measure the Larmor frequency. Okay, so if NMR magnetometers are so wonderful, why doesn't everybody use them? Well, there are some limitations, and let's talk about those. First of all, probes can only cover a limited range of frequencies. The impedance of the coil, which is an inductor, limits the frequency towards the high end, limits the frequency that we can emit. On the low end, the uh, the coil is not a very efficient sensor anymore because uh, Faraday induction is, is less efficient at, the, at those low frequencies. And if we're using a tunable probe, the probe uh, range is limited by the, uh, the range of frequencies over which we can tune that resonant peak. Secondly, NMR is limited to using very uh, uniform fields. This is because the sample has a finite diameter and on one side of the, uh, the sample, the uh, uh, resonance is at a different frequency than on the other side of the sample in a non-uniform field. So when combined, the different out-of-phase frequencies cancel each other and kill the NMR signal. A third limitation is that NMR is traditionally a very slow technique. This is because the NMR sample takes a while to recover and realign itself with the external magnetic field. In water, for example, this can be a matter of seconds. So if you want to take a measurement on every uh, pulse, every Larmor detection, uh, will take about a second. And this can really slow down uh, your, your measurement rate. Last but not least, NMR is a technique that is best suited to high, strong magnetic fields. So, for example, if we're at one Tesla, uh, that one uh, hertz resonant width corresponds to about 0.02 parts per million. But when we get down to 2 megahertz, or about 50 millitesla with protons, that corresponds to only, only 500 parts per billion. The more important reason, however, is that at low fields, the magnetization of the sample uh, decreases. Now, viewed quantum mechanically, this means that the energy difference between the spin-up state, or the spin aligned with the external field state, and the spin counter-aligned with the external field state, is much larger than at low frequencies. According to the Boltzmann distribution, at a constant temperature, that means that the probability of populating the high energy state, the counter-aligned energy state, becomes much higher at high fields than at low fields. In other words, at low fields, just the random flipping, random thermal flipping, is enough to take you out of that high energy state. So net result is that we have much less magnetization of the sample at low fields. So that's a short overview of this NMR technique used for magnetometers. I hope this will 
allow you to appreciate the benefits, but also some of the limitations of this powerful technique. Thanks for watching.